Listeners beware, you're in for a scare. Howdy folks, welcome to Nightmare on Fear Street, a podcast all about R.L. Stein. And this weekend, I went to Midsummer Scream! It's a Halloween convention that is, it takes place in Long Beach in usually the month of July. This is the second year they had it. And it was so much freaking spooky fun. I had so much fun here. I had a lot of fun with just the panels they had, just the show floor, the Hall of Shadows, which was just all their horror mazes, as well as wonderful people. Now, this is going to be an interesting, unique episode, because this is more of a recap of the convention. There are some Goosebumps stuff that did occur. Please excuse if some of the stuff is a little loud or weird, because some of the interviews, uh, while we were there on the show floor, there was, I guess, a zombie shooting gallery, where literally every five seconds there was, like a car horn going off. So I apologize for that. Other than that, we've had some wonderful content for you guys, so let's just kick this off. So, unfortunately, I only did go on Saturday just because I had work the next day. But what I was able to do was I was able to get tickets. It was super, super cheap. As well as I got tickets for the um, Dark Harbor uh, Sinister Circus, which was later in the night. And we'll talk about that later. So, the Long Beach Convention Center is a fairly big convention center. And the Midsummer Scream was able to totally get a bunch of these um, rooms, the exhibit hall, and even the Terrace Theater, which you kind of had to walk for, but that was for their main big panels. And a lot of the panels that I went to were things that, you know, of course, it interested me and I would imagine would interest you folks. So at the beginning of the day, I woke up, got in line, was in line. Once I got out of line, I went straight to the Terrace Theater where they were going to be doing their first panel of the day on Saturday. And it is something that is near and dear to my heart, and that is Beyond the Fifth Dimension, creating Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. I love the Twilight Zone, and I actually really enjoy the ride, even though I didn't enjoy the drops. Though ironic now that it's Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout, I somewhat enjoy that drop ride. So they had a bunch of the Imagineers there talking about the Tower of Terror. And while I was there, I actually bumped into a very special friend. I got to meet Patrick from the Kill by Kill podcast. And guess what? It was so much fun. And submitted for your guys' approval is Patrick from Kill by Kill. Listeners, beware. You're in for a scare. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying time is here. Howdy, folks. Welcome to Nightmare on Fear Street and... Guys, we're in the with the mobile Fear Street setup, guys. So, we're sitting in a theater waiting for one of my old favorite rides, the Tower of Terror panel, to start with a bunch of Imagineers. And I actually ended up finding good old Patrick over here from the Kill by Kill podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks so much. So, how have you been enjoying the convention so far? Well, it's great. I mean, we have a bunch of horror stuff. We have people who love horror. Uh, these are our people. I love this whole setup. It's great to be here. Yeah, no, that's I love that about this experience. So, Patrick, what is Kill by Kill? Uh, Kill by Kill is a podcast that's dedicated to the least discussed component of any horror film, and that is the characters. So we unpack all the gory details, uh, mainly of the Friday the 13th franchise, in the hopes that a camper's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we can make about them. Yes, you know, it's always been about those counselors in the summer camp. Yeah, everyone has a role to play. I love the Friday the 13th films. I don't believe they are the greatest that cinema has ever offered us, but they they bring something to the table that not a lot of films do, in which they were made pretty much back-to-back from 1980 to 1989 for that par- those Paramount years. And because of that, they're interesting slices of time. And all the little tropes that they both uh, create and then recycle. It's a film series unlike a lot of them, just because of the time in which it was made. So uh, we like to pick it apart and see what's doing, because a lot of the times they were focused so much on getting from point A to point B that people made some interesting choices in terms of characterization. Yeah, kind of like the one that I always remember. I'm happy that you brought it up was in part two with Jason finding out where Alice was. Yeah. She's like, no internet, no nothing, backcountry gold man, goes, murders her, and it's five years later. Yeah. 
Well, it, he manages to both steal his mother's sweater and her head from a police lockup. Travel to who knows where because we're never really told where she's gone. But I doubt she's like down the street. She's probably in sunny California. <laughs> But she's somewhere that is very, very depressing looking. But uh, how he manages to find her and then eliminate her and then go back to his hovel with his head in a bag and his mom's head in a bag, uh, that's that's a lot to take on. Like, did he bicycle there? Did he hitch a ride? No, he probably had, if this was like now, he'd hit, take an Uber, like a, sl- like a oh, slasher Uber. Sure. And that's, that's how it'd go. It makes sense. The guy does only owns a toilet and his mom's a corpse juice-laden sweater. Yeah, he's probably got a smartphone. That makes sense. Oh, who doesn't have a smartphone nowadays? I'm pretty sure Freddy Cougar has one. He has a power glove, so oh, anything's true. possible. He's always been on the edge of technology. Oh, yeah. The very bleeding edge, as it were. So, Patrick, mm-hmm. how familiar are you with Goosebumps? Seeing how you're a father... It would be interesting to hear your perspective of Goosebumps and being a person that loves horror. Would this be something that you would want to introduce to your kid? We have started. Uh, He uh, watched the movie and got very interested. And he was a little freaked out the previous year about it. But then this year he saw... The uh, the abominable snowman of Pasadena said, "Oh, I want to read that." So he'll read it with me. He won't read it alone. Like he'll read Magic Treehouse alone. He'll do those sort of gentle adventure things on his own. Now he's starting to venture into it. I think he part of it is he wants me to be involved, and I'd be involved no matter what he wanted to read. But uh, the other part is that he's subtly this is his graduating step from Scooby Doo. Oh yeah, because. I had a really funny joke with my friend on how Goosebumps and Scooby Doo are like the gateway drugs to harder, to harder mm. horror. Because right after that, my dad started showing me Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth, <laughs> Final Destination, movies that you shouldn't show a five-year-old. Oh, but that's, it, bit, yeah, that, yeah. that's why I've I've spiraled downwards into a <laughs> cascade of being in a horror movie convention right now. I also think it depends on the kid. I mean, my kiddo is just a. I know what his limits are, and those are beyond his limits. Although, he is fascinated by the idea of them. So, eventually, maybe we'll get there. Oh, there's this my good friend Trevor. Hey, Trevor. Hi. <laughs> That's super interesting. It's interesting to see, like, just the age range and how, like, a person, especially with a kid's horror, and how they can get spooked out so easily with things that we look at now. It's like, how does someone get kind of spooked at this? But... But it happens. It's designed for children to get... It really preys on their fears. Well, it, it lights a spark of imagination. And as an adult, it takes a lot more fuel to really creep you out for the most part. But a kid, all it takes is that one little spark. And they create a forest fire out of it. And that can be anything from the idea of eating broccoli at dinner... To something they read in a book or even hear about in abstract. Like, my kid got super scared at the very idea of Tower of Terror, for example. This year, he went on it, had the best time of his life. So, it just really depends on what kind of kid you got and what it takes for them to uh, (laughs) take the idea of something and create an entire world around it in their head. That's awesome. Patrick, what is your favorite Goosebumps book? Well, I have, to, I have to admit that when I came into R.L. Stein, he wasn't even at the Fear Street stage. Oh, he was still writing the Indiana Jones Choose Your Own Adventures? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yes, he was, actually. Um, but I kind of came into his sphere through the Christopher Pike era books in the 90s. So, oh, so like Point Horror? And The Babysitter. And so... Yeah. They, they they were larks. Like, I just would consume anything that even leaned in that direction. So I kind of skipped Goosebumps as a, in terms of what I consumed. But I now, as I mentioned, because I've got a kiddo, I'm now right back into it. So as soon as I started to read the books, I was like, oh, i got to seek out people who who are steeped in this. Like, <laughs> what, do, what do they love about this? Um, and sort of uh, and bathe in their enthusiasm for it. That's why we're here at Nightmare on Fear Street. We try to figure out, pick apart, because the very simple books, even with they're almost timeless, you don't have to have necessarily cell phones and stuff. You just have to have the kids 
in the camp because mm-hmm. everyone's gone to either a summer camp or has been a kid, hopefully, not like test tube babies. <laughs> but you know, it's it's the simplicity that makes them wonderful. Especially like I was, my friend started collecting Christopher Pike books, so I was looking up plots and stuff, and they're just like, "Yeesh, these haven't uh, aged well." I, they are very individual to the time, that, that is for sure. But I think anything that's aimed at a teen audience is going for a level of immediacy. Anything that's aimed at that tween audience can have a more timeless feel to it because you might not necessarily have access to your own cell phone. You may not have access to your own computer. You're still living very much an unindependent life, and that is universal for, for most kids. Yeah, I believe my mom would call that freeloading, but that's yeah. a different story. <laughs> Six one half dozen the other. <laughs> so what is your favorite type of horror trope? Because that's one thing that Arl Stein does is he takes a trope and tries to put a nice, interesting twist on it. What is your favorite horror trope? Uh, I enjoy when people forget how to do something. So if you've, you're a swimmer and you get frightened while you're in the water and you somehow forget how to swim, or you forget how to open a door when that is not something that is foreign to you, uh, I enjoy when people get Friday the 13th disease. <laughs> And they lose the capacity to run. accomplish tasks that they might might not otherwise. You mean like run, trip over themselves, try to start their car, but well, can't? If Jason's going to start bamfing like an X-Men all over the place, uh, that doesn't much matter. <laughs> no, because he's super slow, but he still finds you. Yes. And there's been a lot of interesting explanations for that over the years. But I just like to go fantastical. Once you've raised a zombie from the dead... Uh, he can have mystical powers. I have no problem with it. It's when it's when he was just a crazy baghead teenager that I find it somewhat erroneous. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think the panels are just about to start. Any last words? Any advice you want to give to people that maybe want to go to Camp Crystal Lake? <laughs> Don't. Uh, it's got a death curse. Uh, I heard it from an old man with very good posture. Uh, and uh, if you want to learn more about uh, Friday the 13th movies, probably more than you'd ever want to know, uh, listen to the Kill by Kill podcast. Uh, we're at Kill by Kill on Twitter, uh, Kill by Kill Pod at, at gmail.com, and at the Kill by Kill podcast on Instagram and anywhere that podcasts are sold. Thanks again, Patrick, for being on the show. Patrick from Kill by Kill, so check them out. They're a lot of fun. It was really cool having him on the show. It's really cool that his child reads Goosebumps and gets spooky scared, though I recommend hopefully no nightmares are involved, and sorry for the creation of that, Patrick. Really cool dude. Check out his podcast. I recommend it. So right after that podcast, as you probably would imagine, I had a lot of questions and was getting ready for the next panel. And while we were waiting for that, my good friend Trevor, who is one of the biggest Tower of Terror fans, was in the audience as well. And I was able to talk to him. And the great thing about him is he is the type of market that I try to strive for. And that is someone that has never read Goosebumps, really. So we got him on the show to play a fun little game. And that is, is it a Goosebumps or horror movie? There's a lot to say about hotels and how scary they can be and how one of my scariest fears has been my dad and I used to go in hotels a lot and we'd go in the elevator. And what do you think most really chunky men do with their small five-year-old children? Of course, they jump up and down the elevator and, you know, make sure that they don't, you know, give the child a heart attack. I also have a fear of planes, but that's a different, totally different reason. Thank you, Dad, for my therapy bills. But... I'm here with someone that is an expert in jumping up and down and hoping that the people get scared, and it's my friend Trevor. How are you doing, Trevor? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. So we just actually got done a little bit ago at the Tower of Terror panel that they had with a bunch of the Imagineers, and how was it, Trevor? Your impression? It was, it was wonderful. It was a life-changing experience. <laughs> it's always good to have life-changing experiences when it comes to stuff like this. To learn anything new? Yeah, actually, a lot, of, uh, a lot of good stories, unique stories, and that was what I enjoyed the most, I think. What did you enjoy most about it? Oh, I think um, my favorite was like this, the story about them designing the fifth dimension scene and them having flashlights because they were afraid that the there, elevator going wasn't going to be there yeah it wasn't going to be there i was like oh yeah i totally understand that i'm like i didn't think about that i'm like i could die yeah 
the first drop's always the doozy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it was such a great panel. I loved every second of it. Now, unfortunately, we don't have Terra or Terra here. Yeah, not any, any plans to travel to the fifth dimension to Florida? Yeah, I, I hope to sometime in the near future. Uh, Florida's and um, Tokyo's, actually. I want to see Tokyo's. Now... Do you want to walk us through the slight history of Tower of Terror? Like, what, 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 is your, what is your elevator pitch? Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, I could tell you literally anything about that ride. You name it, I know it. Um, opened in 1994, originally at Walt Disney World's MGM Studios, which is now Disney's Hollywood Studios, and opened in 2004 at Disney's California Adventure. A uh, slightly different version. Um, they don't have the fifth dimension scene due to uh, uh, due to maintenance issues. That was one of the biggest reasons it would go down. Um, and then Tokyo's opened shortly thereafter with a different storyline. Didn't feature the whole Twilight Zone. And then Paris's opened in 2008, I believe. And that was the final version that we have. Um, and then DC has closed uh, this past January, uh, January 2017. Uh, and uh, just recently opened as Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. Yes. So, this is not why I brought you over here, and this is because we're going to be playing a funny little game. Oh, Trevor has no idea what Goosebumps titles are, right, Trevor? Uh, no, I haven't. What, what is your familiarity with Goosebumps? I think I read one or two when I was, like, five. <laughs> what is your vague inkling? What do you think Goosebumps is? Um, they're they're, they're kind of like horror stories, terror stories, for like more like the, the kid, teen area. Um, I know there's like one with like a dummy uh, that kind of gives me Twilight Zone vibes, so I kind of I know that one. Hi, I'm Tiny Tina. Yeah, basically. I'm talking. Yeah. No, it's Talking Tina. Talking Tina. Yeah. So Tiny Tina, because that's Borderlands, and <laughs> yeah, and she just passed away, actually. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. she was 99. Yeah, unfortunately, I miss her already. Yeah, I know. I'm... So are you ready to play this game? It's going to be Goosebumps or awfully named horror movie. Go for it. <sighs> Not the Living Dummy. Goosebumps. Correct. Let's see. The Shocker of Shock Street. Horror movie. Eh, goosebumps. I bought a vampire motorcycle. Horror movie? Yeah, ding, ding, ding. It came from beyond, beyond. Goosebumps. Ding, but it wasn't Goosebumps. It was another book by R.L. Stein. Okay. Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead. Horror movie. Yeah! I know I, that one. <laughs> you no, know, of course you know that. I keep telling you about that one. Uh, let's see. And for the, for the winner, are you ready for this? Earth Geeks Must Go. Horror movie. Yeah. Goosebumps book. Dang. Well, thanks for playing. You win a trip to Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. Uh... He's still torn up about it. We'll, we'll get him on there eventually. <laughs> but thanks for playing, Trevor. Oh, thank you. Any any fun facts you want to know people know about Tower of Terror? Um... I can't think of anything off the top of my head. That Nothing? Not, not that anyone doesn't already know. Or no, already my viewers know. might not know. What, oh. what is your favorite thing that really astonished you? The mirror scene at DCA's. That scene captivated me. That was one of the... That was literally what got me into, like, everything that I'm actually doing. Yeah, we also went to school together, so we pretty much... Yeah. I went because of Haunted Mansion, he went for Tower of Terror. Yeah. So, like, I love the mirror scene. Uh, amazing scene, um, just digital. Basically, it's a computer that takes your image in and compares it against an image of an empty elevator and trans- uh, basically takes anything that, is in the em- uh, that isn't in the empty elevator and applies a lightning effect to it and then just, boom, empty elevator afterwards. Great scene, very simple, but uh, like simple in terms of like a technology, but amazing and really captivating. It is one of my favorite scenes, as well as just when you, you open up the, the front doors on the top of the tower oh, yeah. and you have that, like, four or five seconds like it's just everything stops and you just look down and you're like wow that's fun yeah <laughs> and then the photo op at the end oh it's the best yeah well Trevor yep. stay spooky bye bye it was super fun to have Trevor on the show and some of those titles I was surprised that they were Goosebumps or R.L. Stein titles and which ones were horror movies because I was looking for, you know, ones that sounded similar because a lot of R.L. Stein books are kind of parodies of movies such as It Came From Beneath the Sink, you know, One Day at Horrorland, a many, many more. I'm surprised he doesn't have one for Carnival of Souls. So right after those panels, I was able to, you know, finally get to the exhibit hall and go into the show floor and go into the Hall of Shadows, which is 
spooky, scary because it's a lot of little haunts. You know, people that they put up up these horror mazes up in their houses. A lot of them are so well done. I was super scared. My favorite was this one called the Innsmouth Packing Company. You literally go through like the shadow over Innsmouth with spooky, scary H.P. Lovecraft and all. Everyone, everyone in that hall of shadows was amazing. I recommend checking out these haunts if you are in Southern California. I'm going to be putting a link down below for all of them. There's so many that I can go through, but, you know, there's only so much time. So, as I was walking, I actually got to my good friend Shelby, who, you know, ended up meeting up with me. We started walking around looking at, you know, every knick-knack and who's what's it's. And as we uh, went through, we accidentally stumbled upon the Tuckers. The Tucker family is a wonderful family. They do a podcast called 91 Reasons. So I was able to talk to Rachel, and she's such an awesome person, and I was really excited. Uh, she sent me this wonderful message right after I released the Meeting R.L. Stein episode, and I was I was really surprised at the response I got for that episode. I was expecting maybe, like, one message at most about, like, that was really touching, but I was starting to get bombarded by messages, and Rachel sent me one of the longest ones that... It was really nice, it was very, very heartwarming, and that's the type of stuff we strive for on the show. So, guys, here's Rachel Tucker explaining what she told me. One of the greatest things is when someone is able to tell you thank you. And the second I was, I was a little nervous when I was able to put out that episode about meeting one of my heroes, and I get a very lovely message from a really good friend of mine, and if you don't hear, we're, already, we're on the show floor, so you might hear some people yelling, screaming, asking for prices. But here's a person that's actually doing it right now, is on the battlefield right now, and it's... What's your name? Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm at a convention. It's crazy. It's hot. I'm working our booth. It's extremely hot in here. But for Zach, I will stop and do anything. So here I am. Um, what you want me to share? Just about the fact... So Zach sent me over his episode, and I kind of followed along when he met R.L. Stein because I knew how much it meant to him, and I was originally going to try to help him get a ticket to be in the lottery to win it. We had a family emergency, and that didn't work out, so I felt obligated to follow his story and make sure he got to meet him. Um, and then when I heard the, the podcast, it totally clicked something in me in my own childhood. Um, when I was young, I read books by Christopher Pike. Christopher Pike is very similar to R.L. Stein. He's a little bit more teen girl is what I call him. Um, but I was very into him in the 80s, so I like the vintage Christopher Pike. And listening to Zach's story and about what the books meant to him and what how the, he was able to get through his childhood, I kind of related. When I was young, I moved a lot. And I wasn't an awkward kid. I'm very outgoing. So I had no trouble making friends. My issue was we'd move and I'd lose them all. And I felt like I was starting over every time we moved. I'd have to make my clique and make my group and get close with people just to lose them like four or four months later. So that was okay when I was in elementary school, even through like early middle school. But by the time I got to about eighth grade, I was done trying to fit in with everybody. And I kind of just went into my own world because it felt easier and books it became my own world and Christopher Pike books did that for me and just hearing Zach's story really brought me back to those days it made me want to run out and rebuy the whole collection which I'm I have been on the search now for about a week and I have not located one yet and I've been to like three used bookstores and two thrift stores but I'm not giving up I'll probably end up just getting them on eBay um, but I want a bookshelf I want the whole collection back I want to see my childhood setting on a shelf and that's all because of you and that's so cool I really love that that happened for me and I got to share the story with my own kids they didn't even know who Christopher Pike was and that mom was into these books so it was really cool to do that do you know Christopher Pike is his pen name uh, I do know that. I know that he writes under his real name but now. I guess he also does adult novels, which I've been out of the loop for so long I wasn't even aware of that. I was like, he had, you sent me a recent book. And yeah. I was like, he's still sold in bookstores? So I was dumb to that. I had no idea. I was like researching, going, oh my gosh, these are new books. And he still does new books. And he does adult novels. But I, I think I want that childhood part because that was memories for me. So before I check out the new stuff, I'm on a mission to collect all the original 80s books that I had as a kid. It's, it's re that's really a touching story. It was, it was what I was going to say was, do you know what, what, why you chose the name Christopher Pike? I don't know the reason, no. Enlighten me. I was going to ask Jeff. Jeff probably would know. You think? I don't think so. He would. 
Well, he might. I no, don't know. He would definitely know. Really? Okay, well, tell me because now I got to know. We're all dying to hear. So, Christopher Pike is the name of the first captain in Star Trek. No way. That's where that came from? Yeah, because they had the pilot episode and they weren't going to use Chris. So the ca- technically, if I do like a Kevin Bacon thing, I could say I was into Star Trek before Jeff. Right, right? That's yeah. what I'm going to say. I'm going to use that. All right. Uh, I never knew that. That's cool. Yeah, I found that. I was like, wow, this guy's a nerd. Uh, yeah, he probably is, but I don't know. I really loved his books. When I was young, I didn't have any family or friends that were into horror or scary things. There was no conventions like this when I was a kid. So his books were suspenseful, and it kind of brought that out for me. What was your favorite Christopher Pike book? Do you remember the, one of the plots? The first one I got was Slumber Party, and that's the one I want the most because I do remember it, and I want it back. But most of his books follow the same teenagers. They get lost. Someone goes missing. Someone. They it's have the a, like, weekend. Yes, it's the same. He has that. But you know what? That's why I liked him because I knew I liked this book, so I was going to like the next book. I knew what I was getting. I didn't need change. I was okay with format. Format worked for me. And I am dying to see how he does adult books because he made me completely different now. But, um, yeah, those 80s Christopher Pike books were very important to me. You totally made me cry with your episode. No, I didn't you mean to make did. you cry. No, a good cry. It made me so happy. And I would, that's why I said, I'm like, I need this in my life. So if Christopher Pike is out there, you are my R.L. Stein, And I will find you. And I will wait five hours in a Comic-Con line for you. So you just give me the chance, okay? <laughs> <laughs> any, any closing words? Anything you would maybe promote the booth, even oh. though... This will be out probably next week. Yeah, we were well, right now. We're uh, doing 91 Reasons podcast booth. So, uh, sh- we're also selling Jeff's book, which you can get on Amazon anytime. You don't have to wait. We have a book series called The Six Key. We also have his new Back to the Future fan scene book, um, Your Friend in Time. And you can check us out on iTunes for free. 91 Reasons. We're a family podcast. We're a lot of fun, just like Zach. Awesome. Well, I'm Zach. And I'm Rachel. Stay spooky. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Rachel, and the rest of the Tucker family. Shoutouts to Austin, Josie, Luna, and Jeff Tucker. They run a podcast called 91 Reasons, a podcast all about pop culture. I recommend it highly. Over Listen to their stuff. It's all on iTunes. It's all free. It's all wonderful. It's all silly and wacky, and they, re- they post episodes all the time. Thanks, guys, for that. It was really wonderful. Now... As the day started to wind down, I decided, you know, I'm going to catch the one panel that I was looking most forward to the second they announced it at Midsummer Scream. And guys, we have I know we've talked about it on the show before, and that is, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yes, that Nickelodeon show from the 90s that rivaled Goosebumps. Actually, watching it now, it actually was a little scarier than Goosebumps. Goosebumps had more practical effects. Are You Afraid of the Dark was more scary in the stories and the tones. But, nonetheless... Are You For The Dark? They had the wonderful director and producers of the thing. So they had DG McCall and Ron Oliver there talking about their legacy of Are You For The Dark in the retrospective. And this was one of my favorite panels to go to, just for the reason of you got a real sense of what it's like to make like a kid's horror show and, you know, the challenges that comes with it, as well as, you know, the 90s was like the prime time to make like these shows because you could never get away with it now and they kept telling us really interesting stories about the production my favorite one though was that they kept trying to get uh hating christian kept trying to audition for goosebumps and they're like no stop stop doing that but he's in an episode of are you friend the dark because they also they had, like this weird thing where they would they would produce goosebumps episodes um that would most likely be ron oliver who was doing all that as well as they'd be like, no, don't Hayden Christensen go, go complain about some sand some more. And same as with Ryan Gosling, I was surprised about that. He was all he so he was in Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark? And they really wanted him to be in Are You Afraid of the Dark, a part of the Midnight Society. And I think that's so cool. But you know, due to scheduling conflicts, as Ryan Gosling, pre fame of course, wasn't able to you know be scheduled those times that he wouldn't necessarily need to be there for the shooting he had to go away and he was able to come back for a couple episodes of are you for the dark and say she's and die but my favorite and saddest piece of information they had was we were so close guys we were so 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 close to getting are you for the dark movie now 
I would have loved this. Even a revival would have been nice, but unfortunately, it's one of those cases where who owns the rights? So it's like this weird rights battle, so we might not ever see Are You Afraid of the Dark in one way, shape, or form unless it's Are You Afraid of the Park? That might be the best option we have, guys. But it was a really wonderful little panel, and I loved every second of it. The directors and the producer were truly amazing. They were really hilarious. I guess they hadn't met for 20 years, and they were meeting that time on that stage. So thanks, guys. If you guys ever wanted to be on the show, if you're listening to this, please hit us a message. We'd love to hear you guys' stories about Are You Afraid of the Dark, even working on Goosebumps, and what it's like to work for you know a kid's horror show, just because it's one of those interesting markets that isn't necessarily explored anymore. I feel like it's something that's important because, you know, we adults have the Twilight Zone, kids have Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps, but now there's no... Now, there's, like, nothing. Maybe Gravity Falls is the closest we get to spooky, scary, and supernatural, but still, like, fun. And I love that. It was it was super wonderful, super great. Now, one of the highlights as well was walking around the show floor and actually getting a chance to see the sights and sounds and, and smells. Yeah, smells. As I was walking around, I got a little nice little message from one of the booths, uh, Scented Screams, and they produce horror-themed candles. And I don't know if you guys know this, but the Fear Street Radio Studio, when we record, there's no air. And when there's no air, it gets pretty stuffy and a little gross in here. But with Scented Screams horror candles, right now I'm having the sage one burning in it. It smells amazing in here. Actually, it's kind of hot as well in here because, you know, it's an open flame. But they have some wonderful, wonderful candles. I have the sage one. They were they actually gave me a free one, which I'm going to open up right now. It is the Movie Night Horror Edition. So this, the little cover they have is adorable. It has a little VHS tape with a slasher marathon. And I actually haven't opened this candle yet to smell it. So I'm going to smell this on air for you guys. I'm expecting, like, I don't even know, maybe trees, like people, like, like sweat or something really spooky, scary, like a slasher movie. Maybe just f- fresh blood. So we're gonna open this up. It's gonna sound really good. It's got a twist lock. Oh, oh, okay. So it smells like buttered popcorn. This, I, if I were to light this candle up right now, I don't know what my mom would think of like a, having buttered popcorn smell in my room. But I could totally like if I'm like in a dark theater or with some friends and we like light this candle up. It would make us feel right at home because we pretty much live at the movies. Special thanks to these guys, Christine and Danny, for making these wonderful candles. They have a lot of them. They have, I guess, the movie night, uh, the sage. They have the Jersey Devil and many, many, many more. And they're coming out with a lot more candles. As I was talking to them, they want to make some horror book themed candles. Now... Some suggestions I thought of, if you guys are listening to this. It, it smells like a balloon, or does the candle float? The thing smells like mint, but does it really change to, like, gasoline? Or maybe the blob, it just smells rubbery. Just don't touch the hot wax, or you might regret it. Boom, guys, there are some wonderful things. Now, this comes to the part of the night where the convention slowly started to die down. It was getting dusk. It was time for me to go to the Queen Mary. The last time I went to the Queen Mary was for my prom, and I didn't have the best experience at all. It was sad, depressing, and really, I wanted to look for ghosts and spooky stuff, so I ended up breaking off from the prom and looking for spooky stuff. And that's pretty much how I spent my prom. The Dark Harbor Sinister Circus they had was the exact opposite. We got to go in the top deck so you could like see the Long Beach Harbor from both sides. It had a wonderful stage, awesome lighting, awesome sound, but unfortunately there was one problem, and that was the person I was supposed to go with was actually having car troubles, so I was actually lone winging it myself, and it's, it's interesting to go to a party by yourself when you literally do not know anyone except for maybe those people that you've kind of have an acquaintance with, and that's what really happened um, on the Queen Mary. I was having some fun. I was just, like, getting some drinks because this is a 21 plus over. And the whole part of this dance is they're going to have the scare actors from the Queen Mary. Don't know, the Queen Mary is a super spooky ghost ship that's docked in Long Beach. And it is one of the most haunted things in existence. 
So every year on Halloween, they have scare actors and they totally have horror mazes. Each year, they have different characters. This year, they announced the chef, which is he's like this big guy. He has a chef's outfit on and he is hungry for human flesh. Now, the entire dance, they have the professional makeup. It's a costume party. I met some girl that was dressed as Tina as the sandwich from Bob's Burgers episode where Tina wants to win a costume contest, so she dresses up as a sandwich. That was the highlight. It was really cool. My favorite joke that she's told me was, uh, if anyone tries to grab my buns, I'll grab theirs. And I just started dying. As the night was going on, I was, you know, getting a couple drinks. It was nice looking out the shore when a rather sudden like because it's like the weird thing about this is you see something in the corner of your eye and you turn it and it is Gabe from the theme park duo he noticed that I was you know kind of by myself and like hey buddy you want to come join our table and the rest of the night became this weird like spiral of insanity as you know we all hung out it was him his wife Nikki and myself and we got later on we got another person Jimmy we'll talk about later but we ended up you know having fun conversations they do the theme park duo podcast a podcast all about theme parks they primarily focus on Disney news but they they love horror Gabe is one of the biggest haunt fanatics out there So, you know, we talked about horror movies, theme parks, you name it. And as the night started to wind up, more people came onto this ship and we started getting packed like sardines. And getting packed like sardines, we decided to do the Titanic thing and head to the front of the ship, which ended up being like a little like, not like like a mini maze where they had like one of those tubes like in the fun house where it spins and you go through like a little catwalk. So it looks, you feel like you're spinning upside down. They also had this really cool thing where they had, so this little tent where they had fog and it was so thick that you couldn't see the, like the floor. So you would walk through it and there'd be scare actors spooking you. But not only that, but if you were right outside, there was a control screen panel. So you would look through a camera with, I guess it had like infrared and you see someone, you push a button and either like air pops out or like a spooky horn. So we did that a couple of times. It was a blast. It was funny. It was great. It was grand. That was when Jimmy showed up and this night became interesting. This is where I'm not really one person that likes, you know, dances and stuff. But being able to hang out with friends and talk about, you know, just, just chill and enjoy spooky horror stuff was amazing. And in that time, we talked about a lot of wonderful things. We talked about, I think, some of the things I like to focus on this show Giving back and just even like a little bit of kindness goes a very long way. It's a wonderful feeling when you're able to touch someone's life, even if it's a very small thing that you're able to, you know, go out there and, you know, really make a difference. <laughs> that's that's like one of the mottos here is even the smallest, spookiest thing you do can impact an entire generation. Look at Are You Afraid of the Dark? They're all, everyone, even I'm messed up. But it was that one little spark of imagination that launched a thousand ships to a therapist, unfortunately. We talked about that. That was wonderful. Same as with just saying thank you, getting the opportunity to say thank you to everyone and anyone that you that's ever touched your life. It was really important. It's stuff like that that I loved about the horror community as well as you know these our book podcast because we've been getting messages from other uh, uh, you know like teen creeps so check out their show uh they do christopher pike books and also like fear street rl stein as well as a lot of the other ones so there's a uh, point horror.com i'm giving them a shout out as well as they they actually they're not really they are a podcast but their main focus is that their website point horror.com where they recap point horror books which have Christopher Pike and R.L. Stein is their own series, and it's it's interesting. We're hopefully going to get them on the show soon. But we have like this community of people that want to come together and contribute, and it is one of the wonderful things about this community. And that's pretty much what I really like to talk about with this episode, is how much the community matters, not only to me, but to everyone. Because you go to, like let's say, Comic-Con, And not everyone's going to get along. Everyone's going to fight. Everyone's going to be mad. Everyone's going to be... You go to a convention like Midsummer Scream, and everyone's family. doesn't matter how scared you get, how spooked. Your family. There there was performers there that I love. There were people that were eating balloon animals and spitting them out. And they were just there to have fun. They weren't trying to, you know... they, They were there to scare people, but not, like, maliciously, if that makes any sense. 
and you could approach anybody. Same as with like Gabe and Nikki. They didn't necessarily need to come up to me and like invite me over to their table because I was just about to split just because I, I saw everything I wanted to see and just, just leave. They didn't necessarily need to do that, but it actually, it really made a difference. It made my night a lot more enjoyable just because I was kind of, you know, bummed that my friend was gone. But in the process, I was able to make more friends. And that's what I really like about this community. You can just approach anybody and be like, hey guys, how you doing? And people like will come up to you and shake your hand. I was wearing this awesome like dinosaur, like bone shirt. Like it was like a Hawaiian shirt, but it was like, that style and people were coming up to me and like saying where I got it and they kept asking me questions and I ended up talking to people about dinosaurs. Normally you people like us, um, it, it varies, extroverts and introverts, but it's like almost like sensory overload when you're able to start talking to people about your passions and that's why Midsummer Scream is a great like gateway to that because you can talk about theme parks, you can talk about horror movies, you can talk about haunts, you can talk about anything that even scares you, even if it's as my co-host Meg would say, is it trivial or truly terrifying? That's what happens, and that's what I loved about this. So I just have to give some shout-outs to people, because I left that um, Queen Mary I was expecting. I was going to be out there by 10. I ended up leaving by around 2, two almost 2.30. I have a list of people I, I'm going to thank to make, that truly made Midsummer Scream one of the best, actually the best horror convention. This is not even like a promotion. This is just me being honest. And I had so much fun, even though I only went one day. I was like, oh, I really wish I could go a second day. So special thanks to Gabe and Nikki of the Theme Park Duo. You can find their podcast, Theme Park Duo. You can find that on iTunes. They have their website, themeparkduo.com. They post constant blog posts, everything about haunt, theme parks, Disney, you name it. Check them out. And I also need to thank Patrick of the Kill by Kill podcast, a podcast all about the characters of slasher movies. You can check out his podcast at Kill by Kill Podcast, as well as you finding him on social media on Kill by Kill Podcast. There are many wonderful places to find him, and if it is Friday the 13th, make sure to look behind you because he might be there because dying time is here. I also need to thank Jimmy. He was a wonderful dude. I loved every second with him. He's a really cool magician. The times he showed me some magic while we were on the Queen Mary, it blew my mind. And he performs all over the place. So if you want to check out his amazing magic, you can find him at the Mud M U D D Show. Dot com. He also goes under the name Mud the Magnificent, so you can find him on Instagram or Facebook under that. Same thing, Mud spelled M-U-D-D. I need to thank, you know, Rachel Tucker and the Tucker family from 91 Reasons. Check them out. Jeff just came out with a new book, Your Friend in Time, and it is one of the best books I've ever uh, read that has to do with a person's passion on Back to the Future or there's passion in general because I learned so much about that. So check out that book. Next, I need to thank Scented Screams because you guys have some really amazing candles. You didn't necessarily need to give me, you know, free samples. I was going to review the ones that I bought, but you went above and beyond and you guys are amazing. So if you want to actually buy any of those candles, they actually do special order candles. So you can go to Scented Screams on Etsy.com. So that's Etsy.com slash shop slash Scented Screams. They also have a Twitter at Scented Screams. I recommend even emailing them at screams at gmail.com where they actually take custom orders if you want something. So if you want that spooky werewolf or the blob candle, I recommend checking them out. And last but not least, DJ McCall and Ron Oliver of Are You Afraid of the Dark? Thank you for, you know, helping me find a therapist and relive some of those really bad childhood traumas of clowns, vampires, zombies, and librarians. Thank you guys for listening to Nightmare on Fear Street, an R.L. Stein podcast. If you want to follow me, you can follow me at Suda41. If you want to follow the show, that's at Night Fear Street. If you want to email the show, that's at Nightmare of Fear Street at gmail.com and if you want to follow our web zone that is ghoulsfancies.com i'm zach and stay spooky bye